So let's take our Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 17. The title of the sermon is, We Need More Like Her. And I'm planning on surprising you with that one. Exodus 17, verse 8. It says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go fight. Fight with Amalek tomorrow, and I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said unto him, and fought without Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Uh, but Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited uh, Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword, and the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under the sun. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me, your servant, as I stand before your congregation this morning. I pray that I can stand in the power of the Spirit of God, and I pray you'd lead me and guide me in everything that I should say and what I should not say. Lord, I pray that you'd apply this sermon to the hearts of each and every person here. And I pray they, there'll be many of us who decide we're going to be like her. And Lord, those who are acting the part of her, Lord, I pray that you'd bless them, Lord, and encourage them with this sermon. Lord, I just pray that great things will be done in this congregation today. I pray you'd forgive me of any sin unconfessed in my life but so, so I can be fit for your use. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now this is a very important event in the history of Israel. As they were journeying toward the promised land, uh, they faced their first encounter uh, with an enemy army. Uh, the Bible tells us they came face to face with the armies of Amalek. And uh, these people were a nomadic tribe. And it would be a, they would be a constant thorn in the side of the people of Israel for years to come. In this first encounter, uh, the, the Amalek, the Malachites, uh, they show their nature by uh, conducting an unprovoked attack against the Israelites. And this prompts the promise of the Lord down there in the last part of this chapter that he will totally annihilate the Malachites uh, one day. And this promise was fulfilled later on. As I said earlier, God always fulfills all of his promises. In this account, though, we find Moses mentioned. Everybody knows who Moses is, right? If you know who Moses is, raise your hand. I'd hope everybody knows who Moses is. Uh, we find Aaron. And not as many people may know as much about Aaron as they do Moses. But Aaron is somebody that most people are familiar with. As well as the first mention of Joshua. And I'm sure a lot of you know who Joshua is, especially with that kid's song we all used to sing. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Hey! But anyways, all these men were great leaders in Israel. All these men played an important role in the early history of the great nation of Israel. However, there's another man mentioned in these verses that deserves our attention. A man many of y'all may have never heard of. His name is Hur. I tried to throw you off right there at the beginning. You know what I did? I'm going to preach about Hur. I think some of y'all caught that. Maybe some of y'all didn't. But that would be a confusing name, would it not? I mean, here you are with another guy. And you say, I'm with her. But anyways, his name was her. Not H-E-R, but H-U-R. This man seems to step out of nowhere and he does a great task for the Lord and then he disappears into the shadow from which he came. Now, people have long looked to Moses and Joshua and great leaders for being their role models. And both men are classified, and rightly so, as great heroes of the faith, Moses and Aaron and Joshua. However, I'd like to say the real heroes of this chapter and of this battle is Aaron and her. 
her. Now notice the context. Um, when Moses' hands were held up high, it was a sign of intercession between man and God. It was a picture really of prayer, of lifting up. And as he held up the staff, Israel prevailed in the battle. When Moses' arms would tire and lower, the enemy would prevail, the Amalekites. After a while, Moses became so weary, he couldn't hold his hands up very easily. You, you probably know what that's like. We used to have a teacher in, high, in, in grade school. If he got in trouble, he'd make you come up in front of the class, and you'd have to hold books in your hands like this. And after a while, if you held those books, your hands would start to dip and to fall down. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of the same thing. He is holding the staff up, and it's not too bad holding it up for a couple of minutes. But if the war went all day, man, that staff would get very, very heavy. So you know what happened? Aaron and her stepped up and held up Moses' hands until the battle was completely done. They put a rock for him to sit on, and each one of them got an arm, and they held up the arms of the man of God. In my mind, once again, they're the true heroes in this story. Uh, these two, her seems to stand out to me a little bit more. I mean, here's a man whom we know very little about, yet he enabled an entire nation to see a great victory in war. Today I'd like to pay tribute to all the hers in this crowd today. Amen. I would like to honor all those who are willing uh, to take the second seat, work behind the scenes to see uh, this church be what it ought to be. And I tell you, there's people who do all sorts of things in this church, from mowing the grass to picking up trash here and there uh, to lifting up the man of God in the church in prayer. There is a lot of people working behind the scenes to make this church what it is. And I tell you what, I salute you today. Uh, people are often, these people, these hers are often unnoticed, unthanked, and underappreciated. Uh, they're people just like her. People who perform a function in the body of Christ that is very vital. But who never get recognition like they deserve. People who enable the rest of us to do what the Lord's called us to do. And so, also, I want to do this. I want to encourage you if you've been on the sidelines, to get up and get at it like her decided to do on that day. I mean, if you've not been a prayer warrior for this church, I'd like you to take up the mantle of prayer and get down on your knees and pray for this church to be better. Amen? If you've not uh, uh, took uh, pride in the, the church building and what it is for God and picked up what you've seen in the floor, start doing that. Start being a her for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Now I'm going to share some characteristics of folks like her. And uh, these characteristics make hers very uh, special in the kingdom and the work of God. Today let's look at what we need to do to be like her. First of all, people like her are absolutely invaluable. I want you to notice that. You need them. If it wasn't for her here... Israel would have lost this battle or God would have had to find another way to accomplish this victory. But I have to say, God would have allowed them to fall here if her had not stepped to the plate with Aaron and held up the arms of the man of God. In this story, Moses is unable to hold up his hands and if they fall, then the Amalekites will certainly win the battle. However, Aaron and her step up to the plate and the battle's won. If it had not been for the work of this man, Moses would have had no strength to finish his job or to do the work. Joshua would have never been able to lead Israel in the battle and be victorious if it was not for her and Aaron. Had they not been there, the battle would have been lost. Israel would have been defeated. The job they performed was invaluable. They needed to do it. It had to be done. And I say things have not changed a bit. The church... In the church, there's still Moseses, there's still Aaron's, and there's Joshua's. There's people in the forefront. You got people that sing special songs. You got people that preach. You got people uh, that teach. We got those folks, and praise the Lord, we got some of those folks. But also, we need some people in the background praying and lifting up those people in prayer. We need the people to stay in support. We need the herd. There's still those people who, who get the credit and are seen behind the scenes, but 
Behind all those people are an army of herds. Amen. You follow me still? Uh, there's a vast number of people praying and fasting and doing things behind the scenes that make this church what it is. We got people who pray. We got people who seek God's face. We got people who hold up the hands. We got uh, people who hold up the hands of those who have whose hands have grown weary. These folks are absolutely indispensable. These people that hold up hands. That's what I appreciate sometimes. The encouragement I get from folks. I appreciate it when I see folks uh, who, uh, who, uh, who take the sermon in and ask questions about it. Uh, to what that encourages me. That's holding up my hands. I appreciate that. I appreciate y'all who said a prayer during the wait for this preacher as he got up behind this pulpit. I appreciate it. You're doing a job of a her. You're indispensable. Now every now and then I'll preach a sermon to help somebody. And after the service, somebody will come up to me and they say, I enjoyed that preacher. He helped me. Uh, that was a blessing. And the pre people try to give the preacher the credit. And uh, however, I know that nothing good of mine comes out of my mouth. If anything good said behind this pulpit, it came from God. Amen. Amen. I always try to give credit to God. And if anything uh, comes out of a sermon that I've prepared, it's not because of this mind. It's because of God up in heaven. He deserves all the glory, all, all the honor. But also I know every time I stand to preach, I do after some saint of God has spent some time on their knees praying for me. That means a lot to me to know that somebody is holding up my hands in prayer. Amen. I want you to know I appreciate you. And I beg you, don't quit praying. Amen. We need you. Now let me tell you a story here. Now, Charles Spurgeon, he was a famous preacher in the 1800s. Baptists really regard him because he was a Baptist preacher, but he, they call him the Prince of Preachers. He preached in a place called the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And I tell you what, it was an amazing building. It had two stories, had a big balcony all around. It was always filled. And thousands upon thousands of people got saved because of the ministry there and the preaching by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. But one day somebody came, some, a group of people came and they wanted to tour the building. And they walked through all the building. And finally Charles Spurgeon said, do you want to see the boiler room? And nobody was interested in seeing the boiler room. But he said, come, come see the boiler room. And they went down into the, the basement of that great gigantic church into the boiler room. And you know what was there? Hundreds of people praying. Now I'm going to tell you this. Charles Spurgeon was a great preacher, but I tell you what, the effect, I'm sure, had as much to do with all those people praying as it did uh, the, the intellect and the preaching of Charles Spurgeon. It was God's power that was manifested by the people, the hers, down there in the basement praying. Lifting up the man of God's hands. Amen. And that's what we need more of. If there's going to be power in the pulpit, there needs to be prayer in the pew. Amen. If you're sitting there saying, well, I tell you what, the preacher laid an egg today. Well, I tell you what, you laid an egg too because you didn't pray enough for him. Amen? You need, your part is just as important as my part. Your prayers are as important as my preaching is. If we're going to have a church uh, that, 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 that marches to the gates of hell in victory, we're going to have to have some praying people, some hers to lift up the hands of the teachers and the preachers, the musicians, the workers here in this church. If you're not praying for the services, uh, if you're not putting anything into the work, I need you to be like her. Amen. Please stand in the gap for those folks who are out front. Now the world may never know your name, but when the battle is, it is won, it will be won by the saints of God who are winning the victory in the cause of the prayer. As they lift up the hands of God's servant, even Paul needed warriors to hold up his hands. Who in here has heard the name, and you might have heard me mention it, who's heard the name Onesiphorus? Dad's heard it because he's heard me preach on Onesiphorus before. Onesiphorus, if you were to ask the average Christian who Onesiphorus was, they'd say, I, I have no idea. And some might say, oh, you're talking about this person. They'd confuse him with somebody else. But no, there was a man named Onesiphorus. 
Let me, let me read you what Paul said about Onesiphorus. In 2 Timothy 1.16 he says, The Lord gave mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me, and I was not ashamed of, and was not ashamed of my chain. The apostle Paul was often refreshed by Onesiphorus. I can imagine Paul going from city to city and people spitting at him, people threatening in his life. I mean, he was whipped three times with a cat on nine tails. He was beat with sticks on three occasions. He was a stone to death in Lystra. All these bad things. Paul probably had scars all over his body. But he said, oftentimes, Onesiphorus refreshed me. That means Onesiphorus encouraged him. When his hands was drooping, Onesiphorus picked them up. He played the part of a her. You won't hear people in this world talk about Onesiphorus, but I guarantee you heaven knows his name. And the world may not know who you are, but I can guarantee you God up in heaven will take note of the things you do. And he'll reward you for them. Paul, Lord used Onesiphorus greatly. Now, this church would be nothing if it wasn't for those people uh, who spent time lifting up uh, this work in ministry and prayer. But also this church would be stronger if we had more like her. Amen. It, more people would fill the altars at the altar call if we had more people like her praying. Amen. You can lay it at the feet of the preacher. I mean preachers are used to getting blamed for everything. You can lay it, lay it at the feet of the preacher. But I tell you what. You can also lay it at the lack of prayer in the pew. The lack of activity. Amen. This is a work. This is not a one person work. Huh? This church is a body. And we all have our parts. We all have our roles. And we need to do those with the best of our abilities. We need to be like her. Hers like the little toe down there. And hidden inside the shoe. Not much to look at. Often hidden away. But it serves a purpose. You try to balance without your big toe. It's not very easy. That's why people have to get prosthetic big toes when they lose it. It's a big loss, although it don't seem like much. We all have a purpose. Let's fulfill that purpose like her. You're invaluable. Now let's move on. People like her are always involved too. They're always involved. Her wasn't a great leader like Moses. Her wasn't a great general like Joshua who knew battle tactics and how to use weapons of warfare. Uh, maybe he did, uh, but it don't mention it. Maybe he wasn't a high priest like Aaron, and I know he wasn't that. Maybe he wasn't a warrior like those in the army. He was just her. On this day, there was one thing that her could do, though. And he did it willingly, he did it actively, and he did it faithfully. He could hold up the hands of Moses, and that's what he did. And he did it to the best of his mind. He did it all day long. He didn't quit. He just kept holding up the hands. His hands probably got weary too. Can you imagine sitting there holding somebody's arms up all day? I mean, when Moses didn't have the strength to do it, I tell you, I don't think her had that much strength either, but he just kept on. He was consistent. That's a lesson for the church today. Not everybody can preach great messages. Not everybody can sing solos or play instruments. Not everyone can teach. Not everyone can do the visible jobs. However, we need to remember that the Lord has placed us in His body and uh, He placed us in the place that pleases Him. And uh, therefore, whether we're highly visible or whether we're in an obscure place, our function is the function for the whole body of Christ. Amen. Amen. Remember what Jesus said to Mary. Mary comes in and breaks that alabaster box of ointment. She anoints the head and feet of Jesus. Y'all remember that story? And some people griped and complained about Judas. was like, why didn't you sell that and give the money to the poor? And the only reason he asked that, because he didn't care about the poor, he just wanted to put it in his bag. He's, he's a thief. But uh, Jesus commended her. And you know what he said about her? He said, she hath done what she could. Wow, what a powerful statement that is. She could do something and she did it. And that's what we need in the church. We need some people uh, who uh, just do something. Do what you can. If you've got a song, if you've got a voice like a frog, and you don't feel like you can sing, there's other things you do. But by the way, just lift up that froggy voice right along with us too, and I too would add to the volume. Amen? 
I don't think God listens to whether or not we sing every note perfectly. I think God listens to see if it comes from the heart. Amen. You may not have the best voice, but I tell you, it lifted up. Amen. Do what you can. It isn't important if you can't do what others can do. It isn't, it's important that you do what you can do. And believe me, you can do more than you ever thought you could through Christ. Amen. Be what the Lord has saved you to be and He'll bless your life. The main thing to remember is there's room for all who want to be involved in the Lord's work. Just as there's room at the cross for everybody to be saved that wants to be saved, there's also room in the work for the service of God to everybody who wants it. Now you might, you have to clean some stuff up in your life to be fit for that work, but He'll use you. Everybody can do that, can't they? Everybody can live holy, can't they? Everybody can strive anyway. I know you're not ever going to be perfect. I'm certainly not perfect, but I try to be. Try to be. And then put yourself in His hand, He'll use you. Amen. Y'all with me? I think about that song. Little as much when God is in it. Huh? You might be little. But if God's in it, He can do mighty work with you. Amen. David was a little shepherd boy. Brought down that giant of Gath. Because God was with him. God can be with you. He's not a respecter of persons. If he can be with David, if he can be with the preacher, he can be with you. And you can be little and do much. And God loves using little to do much, by the way, because it gives him more glory. I mean, when he needed apostles, who did he pick? He picked some fishermen. He picked the tax collector. He picked a lot of, a lot of people that nobody had respect for, and then he used them. When he wanted to feed 5,000 people, he didn't call up... Uh, Grub hub. No, I use the little boy's sack lunch. Amen. Amen. He used the little things. David had the right attitude. Now listen to what David said. He said, For a day in the courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. He said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God uh, than to be in the tents of the wicked, to be in the place where it's all at and where all the flash is. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. Why? Because to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord is to be a doorkeeper in the Almighty's house, to be there among Him. What better thing is there than that? Thank God for those who know they can't do anything but are determined to do something. Thank God for those who are unwilling just to stay on the sidelines. Let's get to the third thing. These hers are often invisible. This man hers mentioned, uh, mentioned before this incident. Uh, he's not mentioned before this incident. Uh, but there's a couple other times it mentions him afterwards. But he's not a character that shows up a whole lot. He's mentioned like two or three times. This man, who li this man lived in the shadows while other people around him received the glory. He was uh, invisible to the crowd. The crowd could only see Moses and uh, Aaron and Joshua, the leaders. You know how it is. After the battle, can you imagine Joshua leading the victorious army in a march back into the camp and everybody cheering? Huh? Say, where to go, Joshua? I mean, you can see that with David. When David uh, went to war, he came back and the girls shouted, uh, Saul has killed his hundreds, uh, but David has killed what, his thousands. Well, I don't remember the exact number, but uh, they chanted that David killed so many. I mean, that was a the thing they did. Oh, Joshua! And then uh, I can imagine, too, uh, the, when the people seen Moses come back into the camp, how they shouted expressions of gratitude, no doubt, to him. I can hear Aaron lead uh, the congregation in a prayer of the Lord, thanking God for the victory. All these people out in the front. Then I can see a fellow named Her as he walks wearily back to his tent, worn out from holding up the hands of Moses all day long. Nobody patted him on the back. Nobody tells him he did a good job. Only a few people probably knew what he did that day. To the masses, he's invisible, but in his heart, he's overjoyed. He's not murmuring, complaining because nobody knows his name or what he's done, because he knows that what man does not know, God knows. Amen. 
While no one in the camp's telling her that he did a great job, the Father up in heaven takes note of her service that day and he smiles and says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. The world may not ever know what you do, but just be her and know that God recognizes it. Amen? There's many in our church today are just like her. They're invisible to the crowds. The preachers, the teachers, the singers, they all get their pats on the back. And they hear people say, well done. Uh, but there's people like her that remain invisible. I'm convinced uh, that those that live like her here down below will receive the greatest acclaim in heaven. I mean, I've often thought about who's going to get uh, all the credit when they get up to heaven. I, you always think about all these famous preachers. getting They're going to be uh, big dogs up in heaven. But I don't think it's going to be that way as much. I mean, God does not value you on how big your crowds and churches and all those things are. God values you by this, that you've done what He's called you to do. He's got a sliding scale. I, perhaps a man preaching up on the mountaintop up there. He don't have a big crowd. He doesn't have a fancy building. But he's just got him a small flock up there on the mountaintop. But that man shows up every day. He puts his all into his preaching. He does the things God wants him to do. I tell you what, that man will do just as well in heaven than Charles Spurgeon. Amen. It's doing what God's asked you to do. It's not what man thinks about it. It's what God thinks about it. That's why I'm not trying to win any popularity contests down here because I'd rather please God up in heaven than I would men down here. Amen. I mean, I think about folks like that. There was a woman named Daisy Halls. And a few of y'all know Daisy Halls because I've mentioned her before. But who in here knows who Daisy Halls is? I see four people. You don't know who Daisy... I can't believe you don't know who Daisy Halls is. Right. Anyways, a lot of people in here would know who Lee Robertson is. Maybe you haven't. But he was a great preacher. He's up in heaven now. Started Camp Joy. That's where I got saved. But anyways, well, that's... That's where I first heard the message. I got saved later in my grandma's front yard, but I heard the message there. But anyways, I know people that got saved there. But anyways, uh, Daisy Halls was Lee Robertson's Sunday school teacher. Led him to the Lord. Now everybody that had a part in getting saved at Camp Joy and under Lee Robertson's ministry, it all goes back to that Sunday school teacher that showed up every single day and taught those kids and loved them. And every soul I believe Lee Robertson won goes back to her. I believe she'll be rewarded for all those two. And for what was done in my life. What about, there's, there's a nameless deacon. I don't even know the guy's name. That's how obscure he is. I, somebody might know his name. I've read biographies about Charles Spurgeon. But Charles Spurgeon, when he was a young man, the preacher I've been talking about a lot this morning, he was on his way to church and there was a snowstorm. And the snowstorm was so bad that his church that he went to closed down. So he made his way into another church. And in this other church, the preacher didn't make it for the storm, but a deacon stood up and preached. And the deacon preached and looked to Jesus, all ye ends of the world, and be saved. And, and the Spurgeon was sitting up in the back and he said, Young man, you need to look to Jesus and be saved. And Charles Spurgeon got saved because this unnamed deacon, I don't even know his name, was faithful and was there. He was a herd. I tell you what, when they start handing out rewards to Charles Spurgeon, they're going to have to go to that unnamed deacon too. Amen. I could tell you story after story. D.L. Moody, a lot of people know who that is. There was a guy walking outside the shoe shop back and forth uh, deciding whether he's going to go in the witness to D.L. Moody. I'm glad he did. D.L. Moody got saved. These are the herders. They're working behind the scenes. They're often invisible, but God knows who they are. Why don't you be somebody like that? Amen. And then, the people like her are always investors too. As her, as, as her lived his life and performed his God-given ministry, other people were watching. Sometime later, God needed some, a man to help build his tabernacle down here on earth. A place to, to be, a, a place where God could meet with his people. And when the Lord looked down upon the millions of the Israelites... His eyes settled on one man. His eyes settled on a man named Baziel. You may not know who Baziel is, but now you can't say that because you're going to learn who he is. He's the one God used by the Spirit of the Lord to, to build a lot of the parts of the, tab, the, the tabernacle in the wilderness. 
Now this man just happened to be the grandson of her. Yep. Yeah. Grandson of her. My guess is that Baziel was watching his granddaddy as he served the Lord quietly in the shadows. He watched as he took the back seat while all the others got the credit. He watched as the Lord used her time and time again for his glory. He may have remembered that evening when her returned from the hilltop, tired and drained from holding up the arms of Moses. And while the rest of the camp was excited about the great victory that Joshua and Moses had worked, Baziel probably took note of the fact that it was his grandfather. A man who was willing to serve God in a quiet fashion that helped to bring a great victory. What I'm trying to get through to you this morning is this. You may not have a high profile. You may think that cleaning the church and praying for the service or teaching your little class is unimportant, but let me remind you, other people are watching. Little ones are taking note. Huh? You know, by the way, the little ones take the note too if you're unfaithful. Church is not important to you. It probably won't be important to them either. Serving the Lord is not important to you. It probably won't be to them either. Now things don't always work out the way they ought to. But I tell you what, I'm willing to give every advantage I can. I'm willing to do that to see that the next generation does better. I want to be an example. You ought to want to be an example to your kids and your grandkids. Amen? They see whether or not mom and dad's faithful in the little things. The wise follower knows that life's an investment. And as we do the little things God gives us, uh, we are telling those around us and our children and the next generation that God's work is very important. That's why we should support every event and be there every time the doors are open if we can. I know sometimes you can't, but you ought to try to be. That's why we should prepare for our classes, Sunday school teachers, because this is the most important work in all the world. Isn't it? Instead of just memorizing something like the day before, you ought to treat it like it's the most important thing. Amen? This is why I believe this building should be kept clean. This is the most important work in all the world. People are watching. Let them know this is God's business. It's the most important business in all the world. Amen? When we serve the Lord as we should, we're making an investment in the lives of others. We're making a, a grand statement of, about the greatness of God. However, there's another investment taking place. You see, people may not see what you do, and you may never be thankful for it down here on earth, but God sees it. And I tell you, He'll reward you in heaven one day. Every deed is an investment in eternity. Jesus talks about laying up your treasures in heaven. Jesus talks about the Pharisees. Before they put money in the plate, they'd blow a horn and then they'd lay it in there where everybody could see it. And Jesus said they got the reward right there because everybody thought big, they were a big shot because it was given to the church. Huh? He says when you fast, do it in secret. He talked about the Pharisees. They'd, they'd be walking around like it's, oh, I've been fasting all day. So everybody say, man, they're spiritual. They've been fasting all day. They got their reward. But the people who do it in secret says we'll be rewarded openly up in heaven. Working behind the scenes may not pay with the applause of men, but up there God's taking note of it. So in closing, I'm almost sure there's some here today who can relate to her. You are dedicated to the Lord, but you're never recognized for your contributions. Let me tell you this morning you're appreciated. Amen. I want to encourage you. Maybe there's some here this morning who thought about quitting. I say don't. You're too important to this place to quit. You're vital to the Lord's work. Or maybe you haven't been as faithful to the Lord as you should have been. And you wonder if the Lord could use you. Well, I say, yes, He can. Won't you come and tell Him that you're sorry for not serving Him? And say, I'll do now. I'll be that herd that you want me to be. Maybe you ain't even saved. Well, I tell you what, He's open to save you too. I know this ain't been a, a salvation message that I preached this morning. But I tell you what, His invitation for salvation is always open. Always. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. You say, well, I, th I thought the Spirit had to draw you. Well, if you have any inclination of wanting to be saved, I can guarantee you this, it was put there by the Spirit. 
corrupt man and the old nature doesn't want you to be saved. If you feel the need to be saved, it's God who put it there. Come to Him. He'll not turn you away. He says, all that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. Come to Him. Be saved. You need to be saved. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that You'd be with us as we come to this invitation time. I pray that You'd speak to the hearts of each and every individual. And Lord, I pray that we could all determine in our hearts that we will be like her there in the Old Testament. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's turn to page 351. We'll sing, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. Page 351. Take up thy cross and follow me. Take up thy cross. I heard my Talked master about that. say, When uh, Jesus I told that to the disciples, my life to the cross was not a sign of victory. So it was a sign of shame. It's a sign of reproach. Wherever he Maybe they stretched their heads when they heard that. But now when I hear that, I think about taking up Christ's call. He died on the cross, so we'll take it up. He'll show everyone what He did so many years ago. Wherever He leads, I'll go. You mean those words you're singing? He drew me close. He may bring you to the forefront. Wonderful. But be willing to be in the background, too. Wherever He puts you, put your shoulder to the wheel and do all that you can for His mind. Wherever He leads, whether it be on the mission field or whether it be home, whether it be in the school or in your workplace, or out in the town square, wherever He leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Amen. And I pray that, that was a blessing to you. And I do recognize all the hers. I know there's people that's put in a lot of work here. And I tell what I praise the Lord for you. And I tell you, I, I know you'll be rewarded. I think about the men who helped build the building here. One of these days, you'll stand before God and God's going to recognize that. The souls that got saved in this building that you, you worked on, you'll be rewarded for that. I believe that. I know that's true. For each one of them Sunday school classes you taught, you'll be rewarded for it. So hang in there and be strong. Keep serving the Lord. I'm going to close in prayer. And I'm going to ask.